social economic power of each class. Yeah? That's the classical approach. Here, everything is determined by the relationship between supply and demand in reality. So, the distribution of income is itself the outcome of a pricing process, the pricing of the factor capital, the pricing of factor labor. Okay? And the maximum productivity of labor is the demand per for labor. The marginal productivity of capital is the demand per for capital. So distribution is itself the result of a pricing process. You understand that? It's the result of a market equilibrium, market equilibrium process. You understand this? So everything is a price. Once you determine the equilibrium price in your classical economics, you determine everything. The equilibrium price determines everything. Determines the level. It's equilibrium between supply and demand, and therefore it determines also the level of output, the level of employment, everything. You understand this? Okay, this is important. Now, I usually I used to say until now, until now. Today, used to say, okay, assume that for whatever reason a factor goes up, okay? So for whatever reason you have more capital than labor. For whatever reason tomorrow we have more capital than labor relatively to today. Okay? So you should therefore expect, what do you expect? If you are in your classical economics, what you should expect? What, what should you expect? You should expect the price of capital to go down, right? If it is more capital relative to labor, you should expect the marginal productivity of capital to go down, to fall, right? And you should expect, therefore, the new equilibrium to settle at a level where the marginal productivity of capital is lower, the price of capital is, lo is lower, the rate of interest is lower, and the wage rate is higher, okay? So you should also expect that the technique of production in the economy should be more capital intensive. Do you understand that? It's, it's important to understand that. Okay, how does capital, uh, uh, why should capital increase? I, I only, until now I ran the example by assuming, I said assume that capital, for whatever reason, assume that capital increases. increases. So I can say the same thing, assume that labor increases. But why should we start from a static, from a human situation rather than static, the human situation? Why should I assume that either factor uh, should change? Yeah, I have to justify that, okay? Well, and the justification came, it is already in mixed sense, but the justification came in 1928. 1928, there was a very, now, here, it's important to know what happens in the context, especially for you who luckily are not going to be economists, so that's a good thing. So, uh, and uh, it's important to understand the concept. In 19, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, since the early 20s, till, I think, till when he died, 1946. I have to check, but uh, I'm not going to check, but I, I think until he died, 1926, he was the editor of the most important British journal of economics. And, and still today, it's the most important journal in Britain of economics. It's not necessarily the most important in the world, but now it's America, everything is America. Okay? Like the song says, I want to go to America, and all that sort of stuff, it's the same. So, and, um, uh, but at that time it was definitely the most important, the top journal of economics in the world. It's called the, the Economic Journal. Okay? And Keynes was the editor, was the, the editor of that journal. And, and Keynes said, you know, today you want to publish in any journal, but say, especially in those top journals, you send an article and they send it, it's called blind refereeing. Do you know what blind refereeing means? Blind refereeing is, means that they take away the name of the author, okay, and 
double, it's called double blind. Double blind, because they take away the name of the author, they send it to referees that you don't know, they write back a, a, a reply, they write back a comment, you don't know their names. This is done in economics, in physics, it's the opposite. In physics, everything is, is open, is, uh, is, is known. In fact, in physics, the referees, they sign, they say, we the referee, and in the article, when the article gets published, they are, at the bottom of the article, they say, referee by, <coughs> in the science says, says, referee by so-and-so. In economics, because no one knows what economics is, no one knows, right? So I mean, it's, it's kept like mafia style, secret, <laughs> okay? And, and, and so, you get the article back, they say two, two reports, two or three, depending on the number of referees that the editor decides to send the article to. And, and then if there is a conflicting view uh, among the referees, then the editor may decide, look, I decide to uh, publish or publish, depending, and that's the end of the story, okay? And no one cares. No one cares because it goes on to your curriculum reader, and that's about the, that's the end of the story today. Okay? When Gates was the editor of the journal, of the economic journal, he made the decisions. So sometimes he sent to referees, sometimes he didn't. You get it? Depending on how he thought about the article. Because he had every single article. Today, journals, American Economic Review, gets, this was a market power, American Economic Review, gets an infinitely larger number of articles submitted to it than it could possibly publish. It can have, and therefore they can, they just send, you know, routinely to referees, they send to referees. And then they have so many number of pages, and that's it, they can publish 20 articles in an issue, and that's it, they get 200 per issue, 2,000 per issue. Therefore, they just send to referees and stuff. In fact, you know, the American Economic Review, you pay not to be published, you pay to be referees. If the article is published, you get the money back. So, you, it's about $100 or whatever, I don't remember. Uh, and, and, and you have to pay for servicing this kind of flow of papers. But, now, in 1927, there was in the 20s, there was in Cambridge, there was a very, very, very smart, young, depressed, crucial aspect of this, and, and, and psychologically depressed mathematician. <laughs> and yeah, his name is became his name is Frank Ramsey. was very smart and uh, very smart and uh, but very depressed. Very depressed. <coughs> and Kate said to him, why can't you write something for me? And I told him. And he came up with a paper called A Mathematical Theory of Saving. This is, for neoclassical economics, is the most important paper ever published on savings. Okay? So, MIT, there is a book by Olivier Blanchard, who is now the head of, head, chief economist of, uh, chief economist of the IMF. And, uh, and, Stanley Fisher, who is actually now the governor of the Bank of Israel, but then he was at, at MIT and then later at IMF, and was hired by the Bank of Israel. Uh, and they wrote this book, Advanced Macroeconomics, in 1990. It was published by MIT. Because that was the most important, still is, textbook in advanced macroeconomics, which
which is entirely based on Ramsey model. Okay? But wrongly based on that. Wrongly based on Ramsey model. They put in, in Ramsey words which Ramsey did not have. What is the story of Ramsey? So Ramsey writes this paper for Keynes, it gets published. It gets published in an economic journal, Keynes publishes it, okay? Economics Journal 1928 gets published. Then shortly afterwards, Ramsey commits suicide. Yeah, he killed himself. He was so depressed. Keynes thought of helping him by giving him an economic task that made things worse, I think, and so he actually uh, committed suicide. Another aspect of Cambridge, another very important aspect of Cambridge. Zafa was already, Zafa knew Ramsey. Okay? Zafa was already around because Zafa got to Cambridge in 1924, 25, 26, so he knew, he knew uh, Ramsey. And he was part of the group, in a sense, he was around. The other, then there was Wittgenstein, the philosopher in Cambridge. But all these people were oddballs, essentially, they were crazy, okay, one way or another. Okay? <laughs> they were all crazy, okay? But <coughs> there is one thing that united them. One thing that united them, you know, they all loved Russia. Yeah, that's a very important aspect. People, people don't. But Zafa was communist, so he was always pro-Soviet until he died, until he died. And luckily that he died before 1991, okay? Uh, completely, I mean, Wittgenstein too. In fact, Wittgenstein wanted to go and live in Soviet Union. He wanted, in 1930, or 35, you know, in the top uh, of the Stalin period, of the personality cult in Stalin and so forth, he actually went to Soviet Union and he wanted to go in and live in Soviet Union and work in a factory. He did not want to be, he was invited then by the Academy of Science or uh, etc. And he didn't like it. He did not like that. Right? He wanted to go and live a Soviet life as it was mythological presented as in the factory workers and so forth. Okay? And he said, look, I don't want to talk about philosophy. I want to go and, 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 and work in the factory. I want to live here. And, and so he said, I'm mad. I'm mad people. You know, taken by this big thing, which was so beautiful. Keynes was from very upper class. Also, not in the communist, was never communist. Not in the communist sense. Keynes went to Russia. In I think it was 1924, 1925. He we went to Soviet Russia. 1924, Soviet Russia became Soviet Union. Okay? And uh, he comes back with two observations. First of all, he marries. He comes back with his, with his uh, wife, who was a, a former prima ballerina of the Akinev company. Well, that is to say, she was a person who danced in, in St. Petersburg, danced in Vienna, danced in, in Paris. I mean, she was a person of very top society, because she was a, the prima ballerina of a, the Akinev, was a very important dance company in, 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 in Russia, in Russia. And, but she was no longer, because of age, she was no longer and he married her. Although it was of a different policy mix. The policy mix of Keynes was, was different. He did not have women in his preference function, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, for society's purpose, he married her. Monsieur, Madame and Monsieur Keynes, voilà. Qu'est-ce que vous voulez pour dîner? This sort of thing. And it's not said because because of that he started to play in the stock exchange in London. Because also, yeah, I don't know about it, I have to do 
she comes she gets to Cambridge. For her, Cambridge is a complete kind of desert, you know, provincial living, you know, with these colleges, you know, awful food, you know, awful food, you know, kind of dead mutton, you know, dead <coughs> kind of potato <laughs> on the it's got it, you know. I was so sick when I was in the end. The food I stayed in the college, I escaped the college, I escaped it from the moon, I was in the ah. and, and so, I'm talking in seconds now, they will do it. So, uh, and she said, look, I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to stay here. So, you know what came to me? He started to play the stock exchange and he built a theater. This theater is still in Cambridge. Still in Cambridge, still working, still functioning. She became the choreographer in this theater, director and choreographer in this theater. Okay? So, okay, they were all tied to Russia, either political, ideological, philosophical, like. Wittgenstein, Zafra politically, Zafra really had, I mean, Stalin, he knew Stalin. Right? It's very important because he was the go between. He was the go between between Gramsci and the center of the Communist Party of Italy when it moved to Moscow. So he had connection with the top, top, top. And in fact, when he wanted to go and live in the Soviet Union, Zafra, the Soviet Communist Party, Stalin himself, said to him, look, it's not very good for you to come here, you know? It's not real, stay there, stay, stay in game. It's not very good. Because, you know, with me, things can get complicated, you know? <laughs> so you may love me, you may love Soviet Union, but I may not like the way in which you love Soviet Union and I can send you a bit far away, you know? <laughs> so it's not very good. So actually, they were... They he tried to get his weak and shy, they said, no, 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 don't come. Better that you stay there. <laughs> okay. So, but Ramsey was on that bunch too. So Ramsey develops the mathematical theory of saving as a theory of central planning. This is what I want to say. This is the long story is that Ramsey postulates the existence of the central planet. And he says, okay, what generates savings? What is, how do we, how do we decide what to say? Okay? So, he says, the way in which we decide what to say, which he actually says that's a complete Mental exercise, so nothing to do with reality, it's a completely philosophical, mathematical exercise of a centrally planned society in which the planet decides the point in which optimal savings are obtained. Therefore, you don't satisfy your utility today, you 
give up and you expect to, by consuming tomorrow to get greater utility from what you lose today. So you have a trade-off between consuming today and consuming tomorrow. Understand that? Now, in a in which kind of economy is a Ramsey type? So, in which, before we go into this, so when does the inter, this is called inter, intertemporal consumption preference? Intertemporal, why? Two, two temporal phases, right? So you put consuming today and consuming tomorrow. So that's you make a decision of consuming tomorrow more than today. But how do you get to tomorrow? Well, if you consume today everything, then you cannot increase consumption tomorrow. The only way to increase consumption tomorrow is that today you consume less, you save, hence you invest, okay? And you get more output tomorrow, but you cannot just more output that just replaces what you have not consumed today. It has to be in utility terms, more than what you lose today. Okay? And when this difference is maximized, cannot improve it anymore, that's called the state of bliss. Bliss, happiness, bliss, right? The state of total the state of bliss. And this is where you maximize intertemporal utility. Yes. Like, like rephrasing this last <coughs> concept. Huh? Would you mind repeating this last concept? <coughs> State, state of bliss yeah. means total happiness that you maximize your intertemporal utility. Okay, that is to say you, you maximize the fact that you have by not consuming today, you will consume more tomorrow, but in a way that your utility gets maximized relatively to today. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So you will enjoy it more, yeah? Than today. Well you can no longer maximize that when you it's a mathematical system whereby you can no longer maximize where, where all the derivatives become negative. Okay? At that point, you stop. And this is intertemporal utility maximization. And now, what kind of economy can, so to, so to speak, uh, be represented in the Ramsey model? Well, you can represent a farmer, for instance, okay? Or rather, because of uh, reasons, unless you want uh, uh, maternal breeding, okay? A community of farmers, village, farming village. Because they take, take a farm. A farm will have chickens. Okay? Will have, have sheep. Sheep will have or cows. Right? Certain animals will have corn. We have uh, agricultural output. If the farm is self-contained, completely self-contained, okay? Or it's a commune, whatever. Then you always have to decide for chicken. If you, eat, if you eat all the eggs, no more chicken tomorrow, right? So if you want chicken tomorrow, you have to decide not to consume all the eggs. You have to decide how many chickens you want in the next season tomorrow. So you have to decide to save some of the eggs, right? Do you understand that? And the same thing goes with just about every other thing. How much vegetables, etc. Some of them you have to decide, you have to save in order to plant them back. The same thing with if you have sheep. If you have cows, you cannot eat all of them. Some of them have to be milked and some of them have to be used for the production and so forth, right? Therefore, you you have an intertemporal comparison, right? For consumption. You have that. This is true all for the individual, say it's in the individual farmers, but it is also true for generation farming. For generation, because you have to decide what to leave to your children. Okay? So that's better to think of a community of 
farmers unless you want to make the assumption of internal bread in one farm, you know, brothers and sisters, they also procreate together. But if you have a community of farmers, as long as it is self-contained, it is the same thing. So you have a dynastic, a dynastic model of intertemporal uh, consumption preference. Do you follow me? In modern macro, they use this in order to build an agent which never dies. Yeah, it never dies because it, it, the agent lives through the different generations, okay? And it is pulled, propelled, it is pushed. It is this virtual agent lives through different generations through the intertemporal consumption maximization, not through between today and tomorrow, but also across generations, right? On the basis of Ramsey principle. This is exactly what Blanchard and Fisher do in the book in 1990. But Ramsey thought it as a central kind because in a more complex society, not about farming, okay, but it is the central planner that decides how much steel to produce and how much uh, consumption to produce. And that was actually a central issue in the debate in Soviet Union. This is why I'm saying the Soviet Union element is very important. It was a central issue and the Soviet came up with uh, a famous model by a guy called Gregory Feldman. Very important model. But the first mathematical model of sectoral growth. It's by this guy. This, uh, he was an electrical engineer, as a matter of fact. In the USSR, in 1928, he published. In fact, he published in two, in two, uh, two, uh, Articles, two, two, two very long articles, a Soviet model of growth uh, and on the distribution between consumption. I have it in the Russian title somewhere. And, uh, um, and he published it in two long articles. But that was the culmination of a very big discussion that took place when they started to develop models, ideas about central planning in the, in the USSR. And that Ramsey, that's the context. That's the Ramsey concept, context. But in the center, a central plant economy can decide how much to, to save and how much to lose. There is no doubt about that. Or a war economy can decide about how much to save, how much to lose. The United States, Second World War, yeah, they moved to a central plant system. As the Second World War starts, as they get attacked by the Japanese in 19, September, November 1941, they moved right away to a central plant system. That is to say, they immediately <coughs> raised consumption. consumption of, they raised consumption, and consumption kept increasing in the United States, huh? because they would allow big rations, and, and as output increased, they would allow bigger bigger uh, quantity of society. But not cars, no, no longer. America was already a car society then, the United States. Okay? In, the, in the late 30s, the United States had a, a, a ratio of uh, cars to population that Europe would achieve only in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s. In fact, mostly 70s. America had them in the late 30s already. That is to say there were, there were seven people each car. That ratio is reached in Europe only in the 70s. Okay? But the war starts, no more car production, everything goes into military production. Trucks, jeeps, tanks, whatever. Not so many tanks though. More because planes, they needed more planes. Uh, um, and, and that sort of stuff. Ships and so forth. So the, a society can decide what a centrally planned, centrally organized society can decide how much to save and how much to lose you. Okay? And that's the context of Ramsey. Ramsey is a centrally planned economy. Later, in the post-war period, especially in the United States, the Ramsey model became the model of optimal intertemporal consumption, as if it was the result of, uh, say, 
atomistic market process condensed into the macro economy. Do you follow me? Now, okay, the mind. Okay, this is so the important result of the Ramsey model is that savings emerge, arise, savings arise out of a decision. The increase in savings is a decision to have intertemporal greater consumption in the future. Okay? That's what the increase in savings is about. So the consumption in the future implies <coughs> that you have to invest more, to save more, and therefore invest more. So it keeps the identity between saving and investment, and it should be reflected in the rate of interest. So the rate of interest should also tell you the opportunity cost in getting more consumption in the future. So the rate of interest plays many, many roles. It's also an index of intertemporal consumption preference. And the rate of interest should also reflect intertemporal utilities. Utility today, tomorrow relatively to utility today. Okay? That's the, uh, what the rate of interest should do. Which Ramsey gets in a very simple one aggregate, one sector, one core model, essentially, subject to the principle of diminishing marginal utilities. That's what he gets. But there was no intention in Ramsey to tell a story about how real capitalist economy operate. His intention, as a matter of fact, was, if anything, a, a mental planned experiment. That's what his intention uh, so we can now, from Ramsey, we can now move to Keynes. That's the interesting aspect. Why am I saying that? Because Keynes published the article. Keynes published the article of Ramsey. Okay? So he knew. When Keynes published the article of Ramsey, let's say, in 1928, so say that it was written in 1927, Keynes reads it and so forth. Don't read this now, okay? <laughs> Don't read it. Not <laughs> when Keynes, Keynes was not yet Keynes. Hmm? So he, Keynes was not yet Keynes. Keynes became Keynesian later, became Keynesian between 1932 and 1936. That's where Keynes, when Keynes became Keynesian. Before that, Keynes was a very, always very smart, always very sensible person, but was essentially accepted. Therefore, he was accepted. Because he wrote a, a book uh, which was was supposed to be his most important book, two volume book, called A Treatise on Minds. And that book was published in 1930. So that is a two volume book. Okay, two volume book. How long does it take you to write a two volume book? Two volume book, let's say three years. Because he, he, these people were writing. So say two to three years. So this means, okay, that he was still you know, within the framework of the big sales story. In fact, he, he modifies with very, very interesting things that he introduces. But essentially, it's the, it's the big sales story about business cycles determined by the difference between the money rate of interest and the natural rate of interest. So Keynes is Excel with some British sources in, in yeah, that he took from some others and so on. That's, that's what Keynes. We have also some of these ideas, but it's not Keynesian. That is to say, this notion that effective demand is the element that determines the position of the economy is not yet crystallized. It doesn't. There are elements here and there, but not yet crystallized in the theory. It's not yet formulated in a theory. When does he formulate it? He formulates it, he starts formulating it in 1932. And why is it 1932? Because it's, 
with the onset of the depression of the 1930s, he actually says very openly, look, I was wrong. See? I said, the, the, the depression of the 1930s alerts him to the fact that business cycle stories with equilibrium in them. Is an equilibrium in the business cycle because if the business cycle repeats itself, repeats itself, repeats itself, repeats itself, it's an equilibrium cycle, right? It's like the, it's like a, a comet that comes around every so many years, right? The Halley comet comes around every. Uh, who was the one who calculated? Was not Kepler? Was Kepler? Who? Cal Halley. Calcul Halley. Halley calculated the Halley comet. You know, he developed the calculation and. You know that it comes around every so many. If you know the orbit, you can calculate how many, how often it will come around the helicopter. So that's an equilibrium. It's a cycle, though, huh? But it's an equilibrium. The system is in equilibrium. So Keynes said, argued in the wake of the Great Depression, said, "Look, my theoretical approach is wrong. The one that I written in 1930s." In 1930, the book that was supposed to be his most important book, but I've got to start all over again. I've got to rethink because it doesn't, this approach does not fit. We are not in, 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 in presence of a cyclical crisis. It's not a cycle which will come out through the interplay between the natural and the market rate of interest. It's something different and fundamentally, therefore, there's something wrong with us that we are not able to understand. So he changes, but he takes him, he starts changing in 1932 with the first, with the lectures that he gives in Cambridge in 1932. They're all published now, they're all in the Keynes collected papers. But then he, then, if, if, then he writes the book where he thinks that he can come up with a set of new ideas. He writes the book in 1935. 1934-35, and he publishes in 1930s, in 1936. Okay, so that's the transformation of Keynes, where the principle of effective demand comes up very clearly. But he knew exactly where he was coming from. He knew that when when he was coming from the Vixel Robertson approach, that is, he was coming from the point from the, the theory which. A set of theories, Marshall, Excel, in which savings are transformed into investment through intertemporal decision choices and through the mechanism of the rate of interest. Okay? That's what he knew where it was coming from. And then the money determined only the price level. You understand? The quantity of money. And that goes against that. Boom, boom, boom. He goes against this view that investment is an intertemporal decision choice, a saving, sorry, is an intertemporal decision choice. He goes against that, and he goes against the view that money is the, the enters only as the determinant of the absolute price level. That is big thing, okay? And he writes the book, which no one understands. But that's but no one understood it really, really, really. It's not like Marx. Marx is always very clear, always very clear, analytically, theoretically. If you know the philosophical underpinnings of Marx, the Hegelian <coughs> method in Marx, Marx, and you know classical. You have to know a lot of things in Marx. You cannot just read Marx. Oh, I mean, what are you doing? Well, you know, I mean, I'll go to bed a bit earlier and between. Or in the city, we're going to battle for it, read Marx. No, that doesn't work. It does not work. Because in Marx, you have to know very well Hegelian philosophy and classical political economy. But once you know the Hegelian method and you know classical political economy, Adam Smith, physiocrat Adam Smith, and Ricardo, Marx is absolutely clear at every point. At every point of what he says, it's clear, it's never muddled. Keynes, because he was struggling to come out of the mold in which he was himself brought up, then Keynes is often very unclear. Very unclear. 
And he is aware of that because just after he published the general theory, 1936, he was very unhappy with it. And he ended up writing in 1937 an article in the American uh, journal, Harvard University Quarterly Journal of Economics. He wrote an article called The General Theory of Employment, etc., etc., in which he tells, okay, what I've written, no one has really, very few people have understood of what I've written. I'm now trying to explain to you what I meant. Okay? That, that, that article, which was published in 1937. So he was aware that there were. So this means that I will tell you only what I have understood. Yes. I don't pretend to explain Keynes to you. Okay? What I have understood, what I think I have understood. Actually, let's put it this way. What I think I have understood, and I can defend it. I mean, if people take me to court, I can defend myself on what I have understood. That's I am at home. So Keynes goes against this I, these two things. All right. This, so you know, you have, if you know Ramsey, that in the Ramsey model, savings are an intertemporal consumption choice. So you save more today because you already know that you want to go to the Bahamas tomorrow. So in order to pay for the Bahamas, consuming more, you save more. Okay? That's, that's the... the so let's see how we put it. An act of individual savings means that's typical Cambridge language. When you speak, you see, you kind of uh, the Cambridge College and you see the uh, shelling which I don't like. And, uh, uh, an act of individual savings means, so to speak, a decision not to have dinner today. Yeah? If you decide not to have dinner, the college, you, know, you don't often dinner. It's better not to have dinner at the college for sure. But every <laughs> day. Uh, it's like saying that you don't have dinner, it means that you save the money that otherwise would have been spent on going to have dinner. So an act of individual saving means individual savings, okay? Not social savings, it's a different story. Uh, an act of individual savings means, so to speak, a decision not to have dinner today. But it does not necessitate a decision to have dinner or to buy a pair of boots a week hence or a year hence, or to consume any specified thing at any specified day. So the decision to save individually does not entail putting an order for the future. So, you don't therefore by saving, you don't generate any, any demand, any additional demand for any additional future consumption. Okay? Therefore, he says what happens is simply that you withdraw demand by deciding to save. Thus, it depresses the business of preparing today's dinner without stimulating the business of making ready for some future act of consumption. This is the condemnation of savings in case. Okay? This is the anti-classical and also anti-neoclassical, anti-Ricardian, where savings and investment are identical. That's why he keeps keeps at Ricardo all the time, he's, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong, okay? And he's in favor of Montus. Uh, and then he's anti-Ricardian and also anti-Neoclassian. Anti, anti anti but he's not anti-Ramsey, for Ramsey, Ramsey was already dead, but he was in suicide. But I would say he was against the view that the Ramsey intertemporal model would actually represent a real economy. It doesn't. Okay? So he says, in more technical language, it is not a substitution of future consumption demand for present consumption demand. Because neoclassical economics, the crucial 
notion of neoclassical economics, the crucial point, it will not exist in neoclassical economics without the notion of substitution. Okay? So you always substitute between apples and pears. You understand? It is determined by, so for instance, if you have in the, in, 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 without intertemporal consumption, right? If you have more pairs available in the market, you should substitute it for pairs. You should have less consumption of apples for more for pairs. Why? Because pairs, price, the price of pairs have <coughs> supply. Okay? And therefore, on the principle of non-satiation, you never get satiated, so that is there is no limit to consumption. There is limit to marginal, diminishing marginal utility. Okay? But there is no limit to consumption. Therefore, what happens is that as long as there are more pairs available, the prices should go down. The marginal utility in consuming uh, additional uh, pairs should be falling, but absolute utility should still be increasing. You understand? And the, you keep this process until you have eaten the last pair. That's the perfect competition result. The same thing happens in intertemporal consumption. The same thing. You can, you can have two types of substitution in neoclassical economics at the consumption level. Either you have consumption between apples and pears, and you have consumption between today, substitution between today and tomorrow. Okay? It's the same thing. Because it good today, an apple today and an apple tomorrow, in neoclassical economics are two different goods. Do you understand? They are not the same goods. An apple today and an apple tomorrow, because you must make it a decision, a consumption choice, a consumption decision between consuming today or consuming tomorrow. So they are two different goods. So you apply exactly the same principle. Therefore, if you say it does not mean that you have a preference over more apples tomorrow. You understand that? That's what Keynes says. It is not substitution. It is not a substitution of future consumption demand for present consumption. It does not. It is instead, instead I put instead, it is instead a net diminution of such demand. That's what, what say, an act of saving is. This is a complete, this is what I call if you know a bit of you, but you have Michel Espano, you have Michel Espano, right? Michel Espano is how to say and uh, to say Foucault, Foucault is not epistemological break. Did he talk about epistemological break? The notion of epistemological break, breaking knowledge, break epistemic, the break of uh, in, in knowledge. It is to say, epistemological break when the organization of knowledge is changing. Right? That's what epistemological. This is the epistemological break of Keynes. This here, here. Okay. This because this means that individual, increasing individual, individual savings will come later. To, do not imply a preference for future consumption. Uh, and then you blue, 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 blue. But he says, however, that's where Ramsey comes back here. Yeah? However, we try to, uh, and then we, we, we have a break. But <coughs> uh, he says, in a, like it would be in the Ramsey or in a planned economy, if savings consisted where is my glass? Um, if savings consisted not merely in abstaining, if savings, the second part, if saving consisted not merely in abstaining from present consumption, but in placing simultaneously a specific order for future consumption, the effect might indeed be different. In other words, if you save and you Having saved the money immediately, you save the money, don't spend, okay? And then you go to the travel agent and or, or internet, whatever, 
and you buy a ticket for the Bahamas, for New York City, for Johan, doesn't matter where, you buy a ticket, then you place an order for, you create demand for the airline, hotel, backpacking industry, whatever. So that you create demand, you have an intertemporal. Then if you place an order for future consumption or you order a new, I don't know, bag or, or a, a, a new computer, whatever you, you like, then of course, in this case, yes. So you have to put simultaneously in order for some future consumption. And then in the yield of investment, therefore expectations about, so in that case, if you put an order for future consumption, the business making the future consumption, so if you put an order for, in order to go to the Bahamas, or you put an order in order to buy a new computer, the computer business or the airline and the <coughs> service in the Bahamas, then they have expectations of increasing yield, I mean increasing profits. Okay? But that's okay. But you have to do that. You have to make sure that you automatically place a future order. Otherwise it won't work. Okay? Otherwise you just detract from current demand. You follow me? This is this is the epistemological way. <coughs> right. Let's have a bit. With the epistemological way. <laughs> There should be nothing paradoxical in the conclusion that a diminished propensity or tendency to consume has Spiribus, a depressing effect on employment. That's consumption, that's employment, that's it. Okay, so not so less <coughs> more savings, less consumption, less employment. So saving reduce employment. Okay, so where does where is where does the trouble arise from? Because the act of saving here it is this is chapter 16 of the general theory, but this is the entire state. I'm not going to the things that I don't. The trouble arises because the act of saving implied implies not the substitution for present consumption of some additional consumption, etc. Uh, blah, 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 blah. But here is the, here is the, the thing. But the desire, it implies a desire for wealth <coughs> as such, that is for money. See, that's the monetary aspect of saying desire for wealth as such, that is for a potentiality of consuming an unspecified article at an un at, at an unspecified time. That's what it means. Then here is the big attack. The absurd, though almost universal, idea that an act of individual saving is just as good for effective demand as an act of individual consumption has been fostered by the fallacy much more species than the conclusion blum, blum, blum. all that stuff uh, that by the fallacy that an increase in desire to hold wealth being much the same thing as an increased desire to hold investment an increase in the desire to hold wealth financial wealth therefore it is not the same thing as an increased desire to hold investment, investment in machinery, plant, equipment, that sort of stuff. You see, this one. So the fallacy is that is that for the demand that activates the economy, an act of individual consumption is the same thing as an act of an increased desire 
of holding wealth. No, because it does not mean that holding wealth, financial wealth, leads to an increase in physical investment. Do you understand the logic of gains? Okay. Why all the previous things had the opposite idea? The, the previous, Ricardo, in the classics it's clear why they had the opposite idea. It is clear because they worked with the core model. You have the core model at the basis of your analysis and you ask yourself, the surplus comes out of corn and therefore why do you have to hold on to corn without either investing, planting, or consuming. It makes no sense. But they didn't do a cross-checking with the reality that all economy is not based on the corn model. No, they got around it. I mean, they tried. That's what the labor theory of value allows them to do. So, with the labor theory of values, you measure everything as if it were a core model. Because it's the quantity of labor time necessary to produce commodities that determines <coughs> the commodity. That value then gets split into profits, wages, and rent in Ricardo, into profits, wages, and marks, right? But the principle remains the same, it's that of the core model. Because in, remember I said already, that classics are max variant, okay? So, or other speak, every frugal man a public benefactor. The wealth of the nation is determined by production. How do you get more production? By investment. What compels capitalists to invest? Okay? Competition. That's what compels Marx. Marx, page 555, Moscow, always Moscow. <laughs> Moscow edition of Capital. And if I can find it, Wait a minute with me, I can find you. So, but I don't want to quit Keynes. So, because I've got. Uh, I, uh, if I find it, I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you. Where Marx says competition, Marx is fantastic. It's competition compels the capitalists to run after investment. He has to run after investment to expand his capital. He must continuously invest, and competition forces the capitalists to do that. So capital has no choice. Capitalist operates under Newtonian law. You see, I always tell my Sydney students that I don't know how much they understand this, but what uh, I mean, what I'm going to tell you now. So I hope you understand better. Uh, that the classics can be. Light and the classic, not the new classic. The classics can be likened to uh, Newtonian, to Newtonian physics. That is to say, to the whole bunch from Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, uh, Newton, and they all end up in Newton. Okay, Newton, because the classic had a very clear gravitational view. It's a, it's a view of gravitation. Why is that labor values determine final, determine prices? Even when there are prices of production, prices are different from labor values, it is always prices which are characterized by uniform rate of profit. The gravitation is the uniform rate of profit. You follow me? The, the, the forces of competition compel a Newtonian gravitation toward uniform rate of profit. So you can put, you know, physiocrats can be Copernicus, uh, Adam Smith can be, uh, I don't know, Galileo, they put them all in one Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, and Marx perhaps is the Newton. You follow? Keynes, my, my sort of parallelism, is with Keynes. You had Einstein. It's Einstein. Uh, in Einstein, you had reversal of time. You know, if you 
start running around the world, the globe, and if you run faster and faster and faster, you shorten, you shorten the time up to the point in which you can actually go back in time, you know, theoretically. You know that in, in Einstein. Yeah, you can. I mean, theoretically, yeah, theoretically, of course. It has been measured by atomic clock, you know, the atomic clock. The Americans have done it with B B-52 bombers. The B-52 bombers is the feature that you can be can be fueled in mid-air. So they say they put one atomic clock at the airport of departure, the, the whole the plane flew and came back without stopping, right? By being refueled in uh, in air in, in, in mid-air. And they had an atomic clock in the B-52, right? <coughs> and they measured that the atomic, the time in the B-52 clock, it's atomic clock, so it gives you, it has to give you nano, 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 nano seconds, right? The, the time in the atomic clock in B-52 is not the same time of the atomic clock that was, that was at the airport, that was placed at the airport. You follow me? No, no. So, there are two clocks. Yeah, one, one in the airport and one the other one. So, the B-52 takes off, right? Ah, okay, so the other one is on the plane. It's on the plane, okay. the cockpit. When the plane comes back, came back, the time, so they should give you the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh? No, it doesn't give you the same time. That's why it should be atomic clock, because it is me measured not even in seconds, right? It's measured in milli, milli or nanoseconds. So, the difference, it's actually the plane because the plane moved. Yeah? So moved at speed in it. Whereas the, 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 the clock that stayed in the airport was static. So the plane having speed in it, it reduced the time. Speed and time are, are linked. So the faster you go, the time become the unit time becomes smaller. So the plane actually had a lesser duration of time from departure to arrival than the, uh, the clock that stayed in the same airport, you know? But this is the whole Einsteinian notion of relativity. That's the whole, the notion of relativity in Einstein is that time and space are interrelated, that space affects time. And you follow me? There is an interrelation. It's not a fixed thing, it's not space, it takes me two hours. No, if I go at a certain speed, it's a different notion. Time changes itself. So, uh, do you understand this? I, don't, yeah, I do understand it theoretically, but I can't really, get, really figure it out in my mind. But I do understand that are uh, interrelated, and if you go faster, then the unit of time decrease. Yes. But I don't really see it. Huh? I, I don't. I can't really see it, but I think it's a. Doesn't problem. matter. Don't yeah, see it. Okay. This is. It doesn't matter. I mean, you cannot go into the course of physics. You know? okay. What I'm saying is that is that this is one of the aspects. This is one of the central aspect of relativity that you can shrink time. Okay. And another thing is that this is connect, connected to the fact that on the relationship between matter and space. What, what is the relation between matter and space in Einstein? That, that, so matter, that space contains matter, right? Matter is contained in space. But space curves matter. You follow? But sorry, but uh, matter curves space. So space is like a bag contains matter inside, okay? And the matter inside shapes the bag, shapes the space. But it's, so he had the view, which is completely super revolutionary from a scientific and philosophical point of view, the view of a curved space. The space itself is curved, and it's curved by what? By matter, which is in it, okay? That's Einstein. So I think that, given the proportion, here we are talking about cosmic stuff, but, but in, the, in economics, I think that Keynes and the, and the Keynes type ideas 
extend to economics exactly like or the same way as Einstein extends to physics, to the physical world. So the classic, the classic Newtonian that's complicated because they have a gravitational force in it. So that they are completely Newtonian in that respect. They have a gravitational force. The neoclassics, I think they are essentially Ptolemaic, but that's a, 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 yeah, no, I, I, I think they are they are Ptolemaic. Uh, but I won't venture into, into, into this now. So so K for Keynes, savings, but they are not necessarily a good thing. This is the upshot of Keynes' analysis. And since capital goods, machinery, and so forth is an element with which you produce consumption, real estate, you don't, you don't just only in the mythology of the first and second and five-year plans in the Soviet Union, you have people kissing the locomotives. You know, there is a whole scene of... There was a very beautiful, uh, a very beautiful exhibition in Rome about two years ago. Fantastic exhibition. It toured most of Europe. It went around Europe. It was in Istanbul. That's the first time I, I, I read about it. It was in Istanbul. Then it went around and came to Rome about a year or two. two I saw it in Rome. I also the catalog. It's Soviet art painting of the 30s and 50s, and from the revolution till the, till the end of the 50s, I think. And, and you have these pictures about, you know, during the, these paintings of uh, socialist realism, about the first, during the Stalin period, the first and second five year plans. And there are people who love locomotives, they love, you know, the, the tractor, and they love. You, know, you can see people love them. Okay, this is they love the machinery as such, okay? <laughs> because that was the strategy of Soviet growth. But the reality is that the tractor is needed to produce wheat, really, the, to plow the land. And the machinery, the end result, the end uh, outcome of the machinery is the production of consumption goods, or something which can be consumed either individually or socially or whatever. And therefore, the, there is no desire, says Keynes here, that, that people should love holding capital assets as such. Okay? This is what it says. It comes, this view that an act of savings is tantamount to an act of investment, I'm saying in my own words, it comes from, now it's Keynes, it comes from believing that the owner of wealth desires a capital asset as such, whereas what he really desires is its prospective yield. In other words, rate of profit, rate of return. That's what, what the owner of an asset wants. Okay? So everything is calculated in relation to a prospective yield. And he says, the prospective yield depends on what? On the expectations of future, of future effective demand in relation to future conditions of supply, which you really don't know what they are. If, therefore, an act of savings does nothing to improve the prospective yield, <coughs> well, you are done. Okay? That's it. It does nothing to stimulate investment. If the act of saving does not stimulate the prospective yield, there is nothing in it that can stimulate investment, and therefore the act of saving won't generate the thing that in traditional theory is supposed to do. This is a fantastic part. This I understood perfectly. The rest I did. Okay? So, this I understood perfectly. Now, what the upshot of that is, okay, go back to this, is the Keynesian income, very simple income accounting system. Okay.
So, um, so see how look at how he gets. Uh, he defines income, consumption.
It's called in jargon, it's called the propensity to save. It's the percentage of savings over national income. So S times Y equal I. And this point we go here. And y is equal to one over small s. I just want to separate times investment. Okay? One over small. To understand this, it means this is called the multiplier, one over s. It's called the multiplier. That's the famous Keynesian multiplier. So that if you increase investment, so if investment is a hundred, okay, and you increase it to a hundred and ten, and if the saving propensity is say 20% of national income, 1 over 20 times the increase in investment, so you increase from 100 to 110, will give you by how much income has increased. And because this is all in case in order to explain employment, income behind income there is employment. Therefore, given the technique of production, given the assumed productivity to remain the same because we are in a relatively short period, right? So this should an increase in income should increase employment. That, that, the argument for case is all, always in relation to employment. Do you understand that? Do you understand? Interrupt me if you don't understand. Uh, uh, would you please explain again Which the, one? Um, the basic um, meaning of these um, the 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 calcium multiply. But the case is, you run a simple example, okay? okay. So, you, you can set up an example. Say that investment, somebody has to do the calculation here because I, I'm not doing the calculation. So, income, what income? If you have 1 over 0.2, let's say 20%, okay? Our propensity to say. To say 20%, 8% is consumed times. 100, this will give you the income, okay? Investment is 100. Okay. Okay, if next income, if I increase, if I increase investment by 10, mm -hmm. so it will be 1 over 0 0.2 times 100. Okay, so it will be higher. Just say that if there is more investment, there is more employment. Is that the, the relation? In this context, yes. If there is more investment, there is more employment. But, but, what if this time I move from 0.2 to 0.3? Okay? And I don't change. Investment stays the same. Calculate. You have a calculator. One over divided by 0.3 multiplied by 100 will be less than here. You follow? Yeah, I do that. Yeah. <coughs> so. If you, if you increase the propensity to save, people have saved more. It does not mean, on the basis of what we just read, that this area is an increase in investment. So, if, we, if there is an increase in the percentage S that moves from 0.2 to 0.3, given the level of investment, the income will be lower and employment will be lower. If we increase the propensity to save, 
does not mean that there's a, a increasing in employment, not in or in, in No, if we if we increase the price to say and we do not increase investment. So we like have, having dinner tonight. Yeah. Like not having dinner tonight, tonight does not mean that we put an order in the future. So if we increase the propensity to save yeah. and we do not increase investment, not only employment will not increase, it will actually go down because income will be lower. You understand? Yes. That is the bombshell of chaos. Because if you see investment and savings are separate, are separate. The factors that determine savings and the factors that determine investment are the same. Investment is determined by long period considerations and they are based on expectations on which in which uncertainty dominates. And Keynes' chapter 12 of Keynes actually goes or to elaborating why it is not possible to develop a theory of long-term expectations unless you have perfect foresight, perfect foresight into the future. And this is the other great element of things, is this probability approach to, uh, to, the, to the future. Is a probabilistic view of the future, which is a particular, it was considered to be also the founder of what is called subjective probability theory. What is actually, this is his first, his first work which got rejected. Yeah, 1911. It's uh, submitted a thesis, not a PhD, never had a PhD, but very few people had PhDs in those days. You have a degree in that. But he, he submitted a thesis. In fact, that was his thesis, his thesis, third or fourth year, there was four year teaching in the courses in England, then now it's three years. Um, and, uh, and then he submitted the thesis that he wrote, which was in logic and philosophy and mathematics, to get a fellowship in a college, and he got rejected. 1911, it is the Treaty on Probability. And very few people could make sense of it. But actually there was, I was lucky enough, because to, very lucky to, Follow the, the lectures of one of the greatest Italian mathematicians at the University of Rome, where I studied. And I followed his lecture on purpose because he was lecturing on probability theory and no case. And his name is Definetti. Definetti is one of the top theorists in probability in the world. He's dead now, really. He's dead. Uh, but I'm talking about the late 60s, early 70s. And he was a great admirer of Keynes on the theory of subjective probability. And in fact, he used to tell us that the treatise on probability of probability of Keynes 1911 is the foundations of subjective probability theory. What is subjective probability theory? Clearly, he fished his ideas, I mean, it really influenced that his view of probability influence the general theory is very clear. What is is the subjective probability? Subjective insurance companies they use probability approach when they set up insurance premium, right? Buy a car, but why is it enables it enables it is well known that enables insurance to have far more expensive than elsewhere. Okay? But one of the reasons is because the probability of the, not so much of the accident, because in fact enables you, you, can, you can drive no matter 
how you like to drive when you don't get heat. You know, it's, uh, it's like Rome. You know? In Rome, I never look when they drive. It doesn't matter because yeah, I only look in front of me or the side. I never try to see because the other people see it. The other drivers see it and, and they say an adjustment. But it is, it is completely correct. I went to the, there is a the Turkish ecologist who is making a, it's, it's going to be perhaps one of the, in the coming years, a Nobel Prize, okay? Yeah, it's called Roderick, and he's in the United States. And he's very smart also because he comes from Istanbul, so he must be smart. I mean, it's not the, and, and, and so, and he is a Harvard University. And he presented a paper with the American Economic Association about six, seven years ago or something, which he then, uh, this paper was a video, was, it's in YouTube. It's, it, 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 this paper is not a paper where you have equations, etc., etc. It's a paper that talks about, you know, norms, rules, adjustments, you know, and very intelligent paper. And he has basically a picture. He took a picture, no, he didn't take a picture, he got, I don't know how he got it. He got, the fill of a traffic light in Moscow, in a big avenue south field in Moscow, okay? Not central Moscow, the big one. He took it, I don't know, who, he must have had some special connections with the police, I don't know, but he, he got this field, and the traffic light goes out red, red, and, and, and green, and yellow, that's all the thing, and then there are, people don't stop, there are the trucks in particular, they were not, they were not stopping, and you could see over time how many accidents were happening in that particular intersection. Although there was a perfectly function traffic functioning. Then he takes the same, also a field of traffic in Hanoi. Traffic in Hanoi is completely chaotic, right? Completely chaotic. Traffic in Hanoi, people cross. Motorbikes cross, motor scooter cross. There is no there is, there is no room, huh? and the likelihood of an accident is just nothing, very little, right? Because they are just maintained. Rome is like this. Rome is closer to Hanoi than, and in fact, there was a study, as a matter of fact, many many years ago. I remember because it was published in the Monde, many 30, 40 years ago. About, there was a study on traffic in accident in Paris and accident in Naples. Sorry. And they found out that given they made all the adjustment, the size of the city, and the car population in the city, etc., etc., and they found out that in fact in Naples, in percentage terms, there is by far less probability of accident than in Paris. Paris, you get in one of those, those round uh, squares, you know how you get in, but you don't know how <laughs> you get out of it. <laughs> so, so, and, uh, and so insurance companies, it's an old story to tell you, the insurance companies, they probably, they, they develop insurance premium on the basis of probability. But this is, Mathematical probability, very important. That is, it's a probability in which you know the degree of risk. It's risk rather than probability. Okay? So I know that every time I cross the street, I run the risk. But I know that by and large, I won't run the risk. You follow me? So you can put a mathematical probability. Let's say, one in a, in a thousand, one in a hundred thousand, and so you can see. What Keynes says in subjective probability, especially when it comes to chapter 12 of the general theory, that you cannot put a probability on the event because you don't even know, you don't know the event. You cannot, an event, it means what is the probability of a tsunami in Sicily. Okay. Do you know what a tsunami is? You know what a tsunami is. But what is the probability of something that you don't know? You don't know the event. You cannot identify the event. And the characteristics of the future is that you don't know the event. 
in economics. We don't know the economy. Therefore, we cannot put the probability. And that is Keynesian uncertainty. The notion of uncertainty in Keynes is not risk, is that you don't know. Okay? That you don't know. That's what the what, 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 and therefore investment remain hangs, always hangs in this limbo that you don't know. So people take a gamble, you know, some will, some may not, etc. etc. And, and but you cannot establish a specific rule for investment because they don't know. Well, here, you know, this city is dying, Turin is dying, you know, it's just dying in this city, you know? And, which was not the case 40 years ago, you know, a different story. And, if you take, you take the declaration, maybe he was faking, I don't know, but at face value, of the general manager, CEO of Fiat, Mark Five, six years, four years ago, it was all about six million cars, not Fiat and Chrysler, of course, I mean, not just Fiat by itself. And few, two years ago, a year and a half ago, he said, look, no, it won't happen, the investment that I was thinking about will not happen. <coughs> not because the market, of course, the market. European market is not doing well at all. Demand in Europe is not doing well at all. Trends is tendentially negative. The markets which are rising is essentially China. Okay, it's essentially China. And China, there is no fiat in China. There is no fiat in China. Uh, the other market is the United States, which is now picked up again, and that is essentially. Uh, Kaiser, this is spent by Kaiser. Uh, so, he said, look, there is no room for investment here. I mean, there is no room for investment. And, but a few years ago, I mean, and Fiat is not something that, you know, he sits in his own office. Fiat has a huge number of, uh, of, of economists, a large number of people, less than before, so, uh, econometricians and so forth, etc. So they have studies, they, they are connected, they know where to get their information, it's not that they don't know, but they could not establish expectations, stable, solid, robust expectations concerning the market. So they were talking about numbers which never materialized, never materialized, never, never, okay? So, of course they played politics with it a lot, in relation to unions, in relation to it, they played, but what I'm saying is that the numbers that they were producing, <coughs> they were completely up. And most of the thing is, most of the act of, of forecast, which tend to be uh, global, general forecast, they tend to be false. They don't tend, they, they very seldom, some may hit the right note and may get it right, but by and large, they are not very successful in this sort of thing. This is exactly, this is the case of uncertainty. You simply don't know what is going on to happen in the future. Right? And in many countries, it is forbidden to predict the future. You know, the laws there are many, in, in, in many countries, in, in the state of New York, I know that for sure, because I live in the state of New York City, you cannot say, look, I'm going to predict the future. You cannot be like in India, where I once I was in in, in India, and I was walking in New Delhi, as an old Delhi, I must say, in, old, in the old part of Delhi, there was a guy who in perfect English, for example, um, uh, and uh, said to me, Do you I can predict your future? You know, just sit here and I predict the future, your future. Well, this activity which in India is perfectly legal, uh, in New York, and I think in many other, I think it would be also in France and also here, I think, you cannot legally, you cannot predict the future. Okay, it's like, it's like uh, 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 cheating someone, okay? Mm -hmm. Taking people for a ride. You cannot predict the future. Well, in economics it is allowed. That's it. In economics it's allowed, 
it is allowed to predict the future. Because that's what economists do. Economists spend a lot of time not to create scenarios, but to predict the future with econometric models. To create a scenario is perfectly okay. That's what military strategists do, political strategists do, and etc. etc. But to predict the future, to create prediction, that's what OECD does. It predicts the future all the time, then it gets it wrong. Okay? That's what IMF does, it predicts the future. That's what when, when, when they say projections, it means prediction. That's what it means. Okay? And but in case you cannot predict the future. The future is unpredictable. And he was absolutely dead right on that. Okay? So that's why investment in gains operates as a independent variable. Because investment is the element which takes you to the long run. Investment in gains is investment in plant, machinery, building. So you don't build a building for tomorrow. Okay? You don't build it. Investment is something which lasts over time. And the return of investment, in fact, the first years of investment, you don't get anything. You know, the first two, three years when you have a big plant and, and equipment, you don't get anything in return. You, the investment starts to pay itself and to earn a return after several years. So invest in, it is into investment that you have actually the whole issue of the future. And since you cannot determine what the future is going to be, you cannot have a risk approach to the future, but only a probability, which means that you don't know in a subjective probability sense. Investment is something that is going to be volatile, it's going to be unstable by definition. As a result of that. Hence, in the short run, you keep investment even, you change the propensity to save. If the propensity to save goes down, then given the level of investment, employment increases. If the propensity to save goes up, given the level of investment, employment declines. If the propensity to save stays stable, remains the same, and the investment rises, then you have an increase in income and employment. The important point is that the important point is that income variations in Y, variations in income, changes in income, are an indicator in changes of employment. Do you understand that? Income is not for income because I want to have more income, more money. It's not that. It's because behind Output, this is income means output, it gains also. Behind the income there is output and there is labor and there is employment. That's the issue. The issue is employment. So income is an, a proxy for employment. You understand that? That's what it is. So then we can go further. So in, in, in general, therefore, for gains, there will be a number of level Yeah, but the distance from each axis is 
and Germany. You know what was the level of unemployment in the United States in 1932 was 25%. 25% level of unemployment in 1932. And in Germany it got to more than 30%, more or less like this now, okay? In Spain. So this is the the other very important is the difference between productive capacity and actual output, which did not exist before. We can go back a second to Adam Smith, still have some time. To Adam Smith. Adam Smith, you know, had an argument with the so-called mercantile. Does you want me to shut the unless you get me from some because I see that you are coming. Uh, it's the other one, actually. It's the other one, right? So it makes... I, 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 I so Adam, um, Adam Smith had an argument with... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the <laughs> the economists that came before him, that were called mercantilists, okay? The economists, the mercantilists, the very important economists, one of them was the one that set up the power, the economic power of France, by the way, because it was Minister of Finance and in France, Colbert. So, the mercantilists, British and the French, they invented this argued that wealth comes from exports. Why? Because if you export, okay, you get how, how exports were paid, how was international trade, so to speak, paid in gold and silver, right? So if you manage to export more than you import, you get the gold. So if France exports to Belgium, or to Holland more than it imports from Holland, it gets what? It gets Spanish gold, right? Because Holland was Spanish, right? Remember that? Remember that Holland was Spanish, you know that? Yeah. So, and, and the same thing for England, yeah? And Adam Smith was said, no, no, not gold. Gold doesn't determine the wealth of production. And he was right. But the mercantilists were not wrong. Careful. If Adam Smith was right, it does not mean that the mercantilists were wrong. The mercantilists also said, yes, but if we export, they didn't say it Adam Smith, Adam Smith came after the mercantilists. If we export, the net, net export above imports, okay? If we have net exports, then they didn't use the term net, but they meant if we export, not only we get the gold of Belgium or France itself or Spain, but we also create employment. They actually, and on this they were absolutely right. They were right. Adam Smith says, no, you don't create employment. Okay? He says, employment is determined by the stock of capital. That is to say, labor is NK, as I really put it. That's the stock of capital in the economy. N is the number of workers that you can put into one factory. K is the number of factories. If on average a factory can employ 100 people, then you have 10 factories, right? So, you know that this is 100, and is 100, you have 10 factories, 100 by 10 is 1,000. So, L is 1,000, you follow? So this is employment. But what if I write this? What if I write L is U and K? where u is less than 1. 
What is you? You is unused capacity. Okay? So, if I have, or oh, actually, you is the rate of capacity utilization. So, because the rate of capacity utilization. If I operate, if the economy operates at 50%, let's say, like it was in the United States, when the depression hit the United States, you know by how much industrial output fell? Do you know, do you have any idea that when the Great Depression hit the United States in 1930, between 1931 and 1932, toward 33, that was the, the real bottom was reached between 1932 and 1933. Output fell by 50, industrial output, by 50%. By 50%. Okay, 50% means half of the factories either closed or each factory operates at half time. That's what it means. Okay? So, this means that there will be, given the technology, half employment. You understand? So, in Adam Smith, he says to the, to the mercantilist, no, we are wrong. Employment is determined by the stock of capital. Ah, but because he does not have unused capacity in the system. In other words, he does not have this. He does not have this gap here. He does not have that. That doesn't exist in other Smith. The economy is always at the normal state of capacity utilization. This can be understood. Why? I mean, we don't have to blame Adam Smith for that. But it's understood because industrial systems, you know, in a factory, in a steel industry, in an automobile factory, in a computer industry, you know what is the capacity, how many computers, how many microchips can be produced. But in, in systems where you don't have machinery, you don't have technical engineering processes, right? In those kind of systems, you really don't have a notion of capacity. Because your system is halfway between you know, industrial, agricultural, artisan. In an artisan economy, you don't know what capacity is, okay? <laughs> and, but in an industrial system, you know what capacity is, because the industrial system is determined by engineers, by engineering technical, mechanical conditions, or even com computer conditions, which are also technical and pretty mechanical, you know, in, 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 in the output sense. So, so for Adam Smith, the critique is the mercantilist, the mercantilist claim that our exports create, exports create employment, that's wrong. It is, it is especially wrong for contemporary economies. Okay? But this is all due to the fact, because Adam Smith says employment is determined by the stock of capital. Therefore, he assumes that the stock of capital is always fully utilized, normally utilized. But there is no question of unused capacity except you know, for some seasonal reasons. For some, some, but seasonal reason is factor B, it's normal stuff. In Keynes, unused capacity can become a persistent phenomenon because there is no reason that there is no mechanism that employed that brings investment to full employment. And one of the reasons is due to the fact that markets can be in equilibrium all the time, but they are different equilibria. Markets here are in equilibrium, demand is equal supply. Here and all here, they are always in equilibrium according to this diagram, where demand, here is demand and here is output, but they are not at full capacity except this in this form. Okay? Except in this form. In my case, you can make you can have a range of full capacity if you like. Yeah? You can have a wider range of full capacity. But it means that the, 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 this, the, the message is the same. 
that there is no mechanism within the system whereby the economy gets to full capacity. Hence, this is, and then we'll finish, we'll finish every 15 minutes. Hence, to an extent, if the economy is by and large at uh, below food capacity, not at below food capacity, therefore the economy can get the other element which is in strong the economy can get stuck into a persistent recession. So the mechanism is not subject to cyclical process because in the cycle you come out, right? You come out, you go down and you come out. And then you go down again. That's the mass cycle. You can have a Schumpeter cycle. You can have a big cell cycle. But in the cycle, you are sometimes down, sometimes up, and through regular movement in the economy. You have cycle. But in case you can be stuck in a situation of recession and depression, you can be in a situation of what is a persistent. Recession. So we should try to move to a persistent boom, rather right? better to be on a persistent boom rather than to be on a persistent recession. Okay? It can be in a permanent recession. Better to try to be on a permanent boom. Okay? So the story is here that we get to Keynesian type of policies, just briefly because I don't want to repeat. Uh, and is that if the economy is like that. Okay, so here is demand and here is output. And we have this. And we have here. And the capacity is here. And this is the level of investment. This is the investment line. Okay. Well, if the investment doesn't budge, doesn't increase, you see, okay, then you can only make good the difference by something else. And this is by government expenditure. What? Excuse me? Variation of? Government expenditure. Government. Ah, government okay. Government. Government. Yeah. okay. So okay. That's so that's the justification for the Keynesian public investment, public expenditure story. Okay? Because if investment doesn't budge, and we have seen all the reasons why it cannot be relied upon the private investment, then you can increase it, you can you have to make good by public expenditure by government expenditure. Therefore the Keynesian accounting model becomes the Keynesian accounting model becomes like this. This is output, this is consumption, Consumption, this is investment, this is uh, government expenditure minus taxes. Okay? So G minus T is the deficit, government deficit. That's the delta G that I put here. Right? So this is the full Keynesian accounting model. Mm -hmm. You understand that? And that's that comes the justification for government expenditure. But people may say, okay, but what 
about the rate of interest here because the rate of interest we have not mentioned the rate of interest in all this thing. So they say, what, what about the rate of interest in this story? If we lower the rate of interest, huh? won't it be won't it be easier to invest? The rate of interest is lower. And borrowing will be cheaper. So if you lower the rate of interest, money rate of interest, you will stimulate investment. So and Keynes addressed this issue and he got very muddled. Very confused. So we'll address that issue tomorrow into a different author, much more clear headed in Kings. Yeah. He did not want, he, he, he actually, what he came up with, yes. He said, yes, if the rate of interest falls, investment will be. That's true. But, he argued, there can be situations in which any decrease, decline in the rate of interest will not increase investment. You understand this? That is to say, even if the rate of interest investment becomes insensitive to the rate of interest. Okay? And he called this situation liquidity trap. Where monetary authorities by reducing the rate of interest, the rate of interest are ineffectual in the sense that uh, business, they prefer to hold on to cash rather than invest. And so the rate of interest, a fall in the rate of interest does not stimulate investment. So he relegated his case to the liquidity trap situation. Now, many people today are saying that the economy, the world economy, except for China, which is in the opposite situation, but they say that the world economy is in a liquidity trap, right? Because the rate of interest in the United States, in Japan, the rate of interest is zero, essentially. The, the bank rate of the, of the, the, the rate of interest at the Central Bank of Japan is just about zero, just about zero. The rate of interest in the United States by the Federal Reserve is also 0.1 or something. It's just the, the, the Nike rate of interest is, is very near zero. And here is 0.25 in, in, in Europe. Okay? So the rate of interest is zero and has been very near zero. So it's essentially negative. It's a negative rate of interest because you buy if you buy a German bond, you are losing money. Do you understand? If you buy a bond today, a bond today, you lose money. If you put a hundred thousand dollars and you buy a bond, German, Dutch, you lose money because the value, because the rate of interest that you get on the bond is 1.28 percent a year. Okay, on a 10-year bond, 10 year is 1.28 percent. So it's it, it, it's one percent. It's one percent, comma point twenty eight. Uh, so it's just about nothing. And the rate of inflation is about that. So you're losing money. That's how Germany makes money. That's how they make money. 
But this is how the German state government makes money now in this in this circumstance. Because they have they can issue debt and people pay them for that. For that debt. Why do people do that? Huh? Why do, why do people do that? Well, uh, why, like, do you, why do you think people are unaware of this situation? But I mean, people buy it, otherwise they wouldn't get rich. So how, why do you think people are unaware of this no, situation? No, why companies buy? Why banks buy? Mm. Yeah, people, I mean, like, not... They buy a bull. Mm. They buy a bull because they think it's safe. Mm -hmm. to, it's like putting your money into, into a safe, like putting gold into a safe. You know, you go to a bank if you have a, you know, from your grandmother or whatever, black, a, 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 a place, etc., you know, the 19th century, the most, you know, buy, you know, what? You, what you do in the bank, you don't keep it in the house, you know? Say, look, you don't allow us to wiggle out, we'll 
bust the whole thing up and the Germans get scared. So it's a huge fake, like they seem safe because they are allowed to make, calculate things in a way that they are yeah, safe. They, they, well, they, are sa they, they look safe because they don't calculate things, number one, and, uh, and also because they have the power in the EC, in the European Union. That's what it is. They have the power. They are, they, they, they decide. It's a partial liberalis. Yes. We see in the Euro system. <laughs> and, and so, okay. So, Keynes, well, there are many people say that we are in a Keynesian, in a liquidity trap situation. Because investment, it cannot go lower than that, right? It's below zero means that the bank gives you money. Yeah, that, that, that you have to pay money to the bank, so that's uh, and so forth. So it cannot be low, it cannot be lower than that. The result is that people say today that we are in a liquidity trap because there is no movement on investment, nothing much. Even in the United States, the United States there is not much investment. It's mostly through the recreation of a consumption debt. Right now, the United States. Households are getting again into consumption, into consumer credit is increasing, therefore household debt is increasing. And in fact, many people argue, like Larry like Summers, who was supposed to be, was the other contender to the, uh, what's called, the Federal Reserve job. Uh, now it's, it's uh, Janet uh, Yellen. And Larry Summers said, look, what, what we need to get out is another financial bubble, because if we don't have a financial bubble, we are stuck. The growth will be totally, totally below what is required to absorb unemployment in the United States, which are two types of unemployment. It's the current type of unemployment and the long term of unemployment. The current type of unemployment, where you go to McDonald's, you do a two day work, and etc., is foreign. Okay? McDonald's job type of unemployment is falling in the United States. But long term unemployment is not falling at all. It's a matter of fact, it's rising. Long term unemployment. That this will stay more than six months and stay unemployed and employed. It's actually rising. So that is the big issue. It's not the day to day unemployment. And, 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 and so, like some said, well, you know, investment is not rising at all. And, Bernanke has given money to business to fashion banks, fashion banks, and these banks are not lending. Why they are not lending? There is not enough demand for investment. It's not because they are much and they don't want to lend. It's because there is not enough money, there is not enough demand for investment. So the banks are not lending. So how can we get out of this morass? But the only way is that like Samuel argues, I think he's right, is by a financial bubble. The problem is that the financial bubble then gets, explodes in your face and creates it. So he said, okay, we have to set up all sorts of institution systems whereby the financial bubble can be absorbed and blah, 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 blah etc. Cetera, et cetera. But, but he's right analytically, nothing is, is moving in the way in which we, it should, and therefore the only way. And that's it. It's called a liquidity chart because you cannot get the rate of interest below zero. Okay? It's called also by a guy like Paul Kuzman who writes in the New York Times. Uh, it's called also the lower zero bound. Lower zero bound. Okay? Well, that's it. So, Keynes says, okay, investment in a situation of serious depression, investment may be totally insensitive to the rate of interest. Okay? But this answer was weak. It was not a strong answer. And this allowed the neoclassical economics to come in again to absorb chaos, to neoclassify chaos, to neoclassicalize chaos, to have a neoclassical version of chaos, which is what dominated US policies or policy thinking rather than US policy. The policies are determined by all sorts of ideas, but US policy model. Like uh, from 90, what, mid 50s till essentially the early till 1980, till, till June. 
Who's Jimmy? Jimmy Cat. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, tell me. Instead of losing many people in the parallel line, in the front, but 
the answer to go away. Let's, let's quit. Let's go beyond the middle pass, which is the thing that separates Sinai. And, uh, but he stopped. So that stopped. Shackle told him, look, we have to move forward. I said, he stopped. The moment he stopped, the Israelis saw that he stopped, so they took the troops and moved them to the Syrian front, to the Golan, mm -hmm. right? and pushed back the Syrians. And then, when you stop on a very thin line, like that, what's a very thin line on the other side of the canal, a very thin line, when you stop, you have vulnerable, vulnerable points, because the line is very thin, you have to thicken it, to, to widen the line. And so that was Sharon through help of American satellites. So American satellites, they looked at the, at the lines on the canal and, uh, and they found the vulnerable point. They moved to the other side. They moved to the other side and okay, they managed to break through. And, uh, and at this point, Sadat was on the defensive again. Yeah? Because he was here, he was on this side of the canal and the other came behind him. They would not, it would not have been a victory of Israel, I think, but it would have been a big bloody stuff for, for both the Egyptians, for the Egyptians. Yeah? It would not have been a military victory. I mean, that's why Israel is second. I mean, they settled. And the settlement led to the, the way in which the whole thing was settled led to the Camp David Agreement. Camp David Agreement was a disaster. A disaster. And the Carter was there. But Carter actually think he meant something different. He meant different. He meant well and got it wrong. But he meant because his book is very good. It's a book of Palestine, it's very good. And peace in the Middle East, not apartheid. It's a very good book. Very good. So I like Carter. And also in economic terms. Uh, he, was, he, was, he tried to do as much as he could. He was pretty good president. In economic, but he failed economically. He, he failed because, because the American economy was not manageable the way in which he thought it could be managed. You know, coming after the Vietnam and the issue of Iran, so he could not control. But he was also economically he had very good ideas. It's a pity. Anyway, that's my opinion.